Sometimes, you know, things happen in the world where you say, what are you doing? Wake up. You see what's going on? And he's saying to us, you do it. Get down there and, and make it happen. Change the world. What do I have you for? And the thing is, that's what keeps us from making the world a better place. Those things that we carry, the sin, the guilt, the, uh, uh, all those things, we're going to talk about them uh, tonight. We're going to talk about unloading them, getting rid of them. And then we're going to talk about tomorrow night, renewal. Wipe the board clean. Because then, only then, we wipe the board clean and we have this great relationship with the God and, and with each other. Um, God has a plan. And you are all part of that plan. You know, Jesus had a great way of putting the big things in the world to making them understandable by the common people like us. In other words, how do you tell people what God's love is all about? How do you put that in words? How do you explain that? Much too big. God's mercy, God's forgiveness. Well, God has a plan. In order to make the plan come to, to life, to realize it, to come to fruition, we've got to do our part. So, you know, to, to get us to put the best contribution that we can before God when we meet our Maker, we have to optimize everything that we are in this life. We have to be the best disciple. But we have all these challenges, and we have all these struggles with the economy, and life in general, and wars, and you know, everything that you're dealing with. But you want to know something? One of the, the secrets to the stimulus package is to read the Bible. It's one of the things we have to do. It's a gift that God gave us to avoid spiritual bankruptcy. And i got to tell you, if the only scripture that you read during the week is when you hear it here on Sunday and the weekends, that's not enough. There's no way. That's, is that the only time we're spending with the Word of God? Sunday, a little paragraph, I'll see you next week, Lord. Again, you can't do that. It's about reading the Bible. First of all, you don't do what Deacon Tony used to do. I would start out and I'd say, hey, Sunday night, 8.30 at night, good weekend. I'm going to read the Gospel of Mark, you know, and I pull the Bible, I'm laying in bed, I put the Bible right here, you know, and I start reading. And my eyes start getting heavy, and I'm reading. Next thing I know, I wake up, the Bible's on the floor, the dogs look at my face, and, and that's it. You can't read the Bible in big chunks. You've got to take it a couple of passages at a time. Read a, couple, read, read a paragraph, read a few verses. But understand what you read. And the second thing is this. I think it's the most important thing, too. Put yourself in the story. You've got to put yourself into the Bible. Why? Because the Bible didn't happen to people like Zeus and Minerva and, you know, fictitious characters. It happened to people just like me and you. And any anthropologist, any paleontologist will tell you 2,000 years is a blink in history. So those people back then, they dealt with the same issues that we deal with. Analogous. They were in an occupied country. There were wars going on. There were people who were worried about, how am I going to put a roof over our heads and feed my kids? The exact same things you deal with, the struggles that you deal with, the people in the Bible dealt with. And so, when you think about people who have who struggle, who do you think about? Some things that come to mind. The woman at the well. We just read about her. Whoa, she had issues. Okay? Five husbands. There's somebody who paid attention on something. <laughs> Let me tell you, five husbands and another one. And a boyfriend. Okay, so check it out. All of these men used her. I love you, honey. I love you. And they discarded her, rejected her, they negated her. And who does she find something that's going to be lasting with? This man, who Samaritans and Jews don't get along, you know, hundreds of years, right? She finds this man who gives her something permanent in her life the cup of salvation. Okay? We talk about people in the Bible who struggle. You know, I think of our Lord Jesus. Remember when he said this? in the garden. 
in similar words. Okay? He said, Father, and he knows what's going to come. He knows what's going to happen. If there's any way we can do this differently, can we do it that way instead of this way? But what does he also say? But not my will. He's thinking about the Bible, Not my will, but your will be done. If I could make you do something, if I could impose something on you, if I could force you to do something, you know what I would force you to do? Get a tattoo or wear a card or something that says, Thy will be done. Okay? Because if you can live, Thy will be done, the game is over. You're there. You don't have to worry about anything. If you can give it up to God and say, whatever it is, Lord, whatever it is, you take it from me. You take this, and I don't have it anymore. You've got to give it up to God. And that's what you have to do in life. Thy will be done. What was the, that was the theme of our blessed mother. Thy will be done. You know all the things that she saw happen with her son? From the very beginning, imagine, from the very beginning of his life, she had to go into another country. Because people had designs on his life. She had to put up with so much on Blessed Mother. And do you really think, don't think this for a moment, that when they're crucifying Jesus, they're crucifying a man of 33, not to Mary. When Jesus is crucified, they're crucifying a baby. That's who they're crucifying. And you kids, I'm going to tell you something. No matter how old you get, my age and older, you will always be your parents' babies. Always. That's how life is. That's the Blessed Mother's song, okay? And she still said, Thy will be done. John the Baptist stood for what he believed, and he didn't waver. He paid a price. We pay a price for believing what we believe. You know, we all have people in our life who fall off the cliff and do things. But what if we were like this? What if I said, you know, Johnny, I like you, but you cheat on your taxes, but you do my taxes, so you're okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. And, uh, you know, Cecilia, you know, I know that uh, uh, you're cheating on your husband, but you know what? I've known you since I was a kid. And, uh, you know, I love you as a person, so that's okay. I'm going to overlook that. And, and John, I know that you're, you're pro-abortion. You're not pro life okay? Uh, I know you have this different of opinion and teaching, but you know what? I, I love you like a brother. We're on a football team together, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna overlook that. You know that I'm okay, you're okay attitude. Well, when we stand for everything, we stand for nothing. Because as Catholics, we have a certain code that we follow: the commandments, the teachings of Christ. The teachings of the church, they're almost one and the same. So we cannot say that we like a mixed bag of things. We can't choose what we like. Okay? It's like saying, who believes in the Eight Commandments? Right? Okay? Which one did I leave out? Okay. So, you get it? So we have to hold to what we believe as Catholics. Very important. Because otherwise, we don't see it right we just, we just stand for everything. And it does not distinguish us from people who aren't disciples of Christ. <clears throat> Unlike a car inspection or your Sam's Club card, you have to renew your membership in the Catholic faith every day of your life. Every day. Because you face challenges every day of your life that are going to put your Christianity, that are going to put your discipleship to the test. It's easy to give the sign of peace at Mass, right? Everyone's here for the same reason. You know, we're all here. We're all looking for something. I don't know anyone who comes to church who's not looking for something. But we're all here for the same reason. We want to feel good. We want to, we want to enjoy our fellowship. We want to partake in the Eucharist, hear the Word of God. We're all here for the same reason. So to offer each other a sign of peace during Mass, that's easy. There's no risk involved. You want to impress Jesus? Go out there and give the sign of peace to some stranger. Go out there and find somebody you've been banging heads with for so long, but you know you can't stand, he can't stand you. Go out and offer that person your hand and say, let's put it all behind us if you want to impress Jesus. 
So the good thing about being a disciple of Christ is that when you stand up for something like John did, you're going to pay a price, maybe. You take a risk. And whenever you take a risk, maybe someone who you like now thinks different than you, maybe someone in your family doesn't think the same way, maybe you're a lack to somebody else, whatever. But you take a risk. And here's one thing, and we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, but here's one thing Catholics cannot do. You cannot be this. What is that? <coughs> afraid. You cannot be afraid. We believe what we believe, and we're proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we have to have hope. We have to have hope that no matter what happens in this world, tomorrow's going to be better because of the things we do. And things that are bad right now, are not going to be bad for us. And it's up to us to make it that way. But the killer of hope is despair. When people think that you cannot get out of that pit, that you're stuck there. That's when people say, I can't go on anymore. I can't do it anymore. I want to say something. And you know what? After I say this, we're going to have a song. But I don't get to lead after I say what I'm going to say right now. Because this is, the, to me, the most important thing that I can give to you. And I'm talking to anybody here who has seen their, uh, who has seen their 401k become a 201k. <laughs> I'm talking to anybody here who uh, thinks they're going to lose their job. Or maybe you've lost your job. And you think, how am I going to provide for my family? the kind of lifestyle I wanted to give them, put food on the table and get a roof over. How do we keep a roof over our head? I'm talking to anybody who has a, a friend or a family member who's very sick, maybe terminal, a spouse or a parent, or worse of all, a child. And I want to talk to anybody here who, when that alarm clock rings in the morning, wants to pull those covers over your head and not get up because you don't want to face the challenges and the stresses of that day that you know that day is going to bring to your power. To anybody here who is one of those people, and, and to anyone else, I want you to hear this, that I know more than my own name. God is in control. God is in control. And he didn't bring you all this way to discard you and leave you there with nothing. He's got plans for you. And you've got to just give it up to him. And all you've got to do is believe. Give it up to God. And my favorite passage from Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth passed away and the sea was no more. Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain. For the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. My friends, you need to be a new creation in Christ. I need to be a new creation in Christ. I hope that in these past two days that we have been spent with each other for two hours, that we've been able to live, laugh, look at examples, see ourselves in these stories, and be able to have a path forward to avoid any kind of bankruptcy in our lives so that we can always have a full spiritual account because of the love of Christ in our lives. Don't wait for someone else to take the lead. You be an ambassador of Christ. Don't leave it to somebody else. You be the one who is the trailblazer in your community, in your family. He's depending on each one of us to fulfill this plan. It's up to you to make it happen. I hope 
that this has been a worthwhile journey for you. I hope that, like I say, you'll be able to take something you've listened to and bring it to other people. Because if we don't do that, then how are we apostolic? How are we fulfilling our role as disciples? And I'm confident that you know, mainly because everyone knows scripture by chapter and verse in this place. So